institutional equities uh, division of uh, Spark Capital Advisor. He is also uh, uh, Spark's uh, India the chief India strategist. Uh, a little bit on Spark Capital. Uh, uh, Spark Capital is a 20-year young investment bank stroke institutional equities house, um, largely employee-owned. The team consists of 30-plus analysts who come with deep domain knowledge and collectively cover over uh, 250 companies across uh, 17 sectors, uh, backed by their rigorous company analysis, high-frequency data points, together with an informed view of management quality, all of which uh, help them uh, to put up a robust track record of uh, successful stock calls and sector calls. As regard Ganesh, uh, Ganesh heads the institutional equities division, as I mentioned, uh, homegrown and a highly rated banking analyst has over uh, 15 years of experience in equities. Uh, his, he uses his background and network in corporate banking to go an extra mile with his research having spent years with Standard Chartered Bank and HSBC in the past. By qualification, Ganesh is a certified public accountant. Uh, with that introduction, I'll hand over the virtual mic to Ganesh for his presentation, uh, post which we'll open the floor for Q&A. Over to you, Ganesh. Thanks, thanks Gaurav. Uh, thanks Mukundan for, uh, for this opportunity. I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to take you through my thoughts on uh, India Outlook. Just hold on a moment. Can you confirm seeing my screen? Yes, Ganesh. Okay, great. Uh, what we're going to discuss today is uh, two parts. Uh, one is uh, what is the outlook for India? What, how are we positioning or recommending our clients to have their India portfolio positioned? Which sectors, which stocks? And, and uh, why? Another, another part which we are going to focus a little more attention is uh, why are Indian valuations optically misleading or they appear expensive, but they actually <clears throat> can be, there is so much scope for uh, uh, getting misled by this. <clears throat> I'm going to take you through some numbers in explaining that. So, so first, let me take you through my thoughts on, on why we are positive on India. Now, this slide, you know, uh, I'm trying to connect some dots out here. Okay. Now, if you look at the table on the top left out here, okay pandemic impacted year, which is fiscal year ending March 21. Okay. But paradoxically, balances in the household's uh, bank accounts have exploded during this period. Okay. Normally it goes up about three and a half to 4 trillion rupees. It's gone up by 7.5 trillion rupees. Now, uh, on the face of it, this is uh, dichotomous because you have seen businesses impacted, households having uh, their incomes impacted during the pandemic. But on the contrary, balances in car businesses' bank accounts and households' bank accounts have expanded. Now, there are two Indias within India, okay? Or there are actually multiple Indias within India. But, but, but what I'm trying to highlight is uh, there is one portion of the economy, one portion of the households, uh, which have dramatically seen their income profiles improve during this period. And they are going to drive consumption going forward. Kenneth was talking to you about household leverage in India being on the higher side, which is true. But there are multiple Indias within India. There is one portion of India whose income profiles have expanded and savings have actually accumulated in the bank accounts during this period. India has seen $150 billion of foreign exchange reserves accretion during the pandemic period of 15 months. This is highest in the world. And which means somebody has got that money in converted into rupees in INR terms in their bank accounts. Where are they going to spend it? And we believe that accumulated banking bank account balances tend to behave differently vis-a-vis -vis monthly inflows and outflows. In other words, what we think is the character of expenditure when this money gets spent by the households is likely to be more uh, discretionary in nature, leveraged consumption 
household capital expenditure and he was talking about real estate that is something that we are positive about as well we think households have been spending less on uh, property on on uh, housing for the last 8 9 years property prices have been have been flattish and and that gives us confidence that this data point is a very important ingredient in how we are seeing that portion of the households likely to consume and they are going to be a driver which is a point to be kept in mind the second point is the table out here in the middle now banks there is something called slr in india which is basically called statutory liquidity ratio keep the jargon aside it largely means the proportion of deposits that banks need to park in government liquid bonds uh government bonds okay now the regulatory requirement is 18% but banks have parked 29% so this is last something like this was seen in 2003 where over the ensuing 3 years banks converted those excess bonds into retail and corporate loans and companies who could not imagine a certain customer becoming affordable getting affordable to buy their products could find could find funding uh, consumer lending opportunities and that drove demand now the question now is in the last 10 years corporates have deleveraged and corporate lending has been absent for almost a decade in india i am talking of uh, working capital funding or more importantly project fin financing for capital expenditure by corporates we think that in the ensuing 3 to 5 years banks actually will focus their attention more on corporate financing banks uh, and 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 we are positive on capex cycle i'm going to talk to you on the ensuing slides so so when investors look at india and say where will the next 3 years demand come from look at these numbers 10 trillion rupees is what banks are sitting the the households and businesses are sitting on the on their own bank accounts and when you look at the how the banks are positioned 17 trillion rupees which almost 10% of the gdp and add the excess liquidity in the banking system about 10% of india's gdp is sitting on buffer or or excess liquidity in banks for them to lend to corporates or to households for their ensuing borrowing and consumption this is unprecedented and this is to me the biggest opportunity upside that we are sitting on this is one point to highlight where demand will come from okay now the second point consolidation this is a very very important point in our whole thought process now what i wanted to highlight out here is if you look at the last 4 years about 25 different industry segments or sub sectors have seen disproportionate market share gains by a top few players in for example these six banks were 43% of the market share in fiscal 17 but on the incremental growth in the last 4 years they have taken over 67% of the growth these two housing finance companies were 70% and losing market share but in the last 4 years they have disproportionately gained market share the same story is in cement in steel telecom aviation real estate ports power passenger cars i mean the list is long now why is this important why is this a big change which is coming it is important in the context of inflation okay commodity inflation in other words what i'm saying is demand plus consolidation plus inflation leads to pricing power now i wanted to explain this point with this chart out here now this is 30 years of corporate profit to gdp and i'm mapping it with inflation inflation is an indicator of demand now in the early 90s in around the mid 90 asian financial crisis came around 97 98 corporate profitability took a nose dive and it recovered in the 2003 to 5 period now same time last 5 years corporate profitability has nose dive and we see it now recovering inflation is a lead indicator now the points are this 
during early during what happens is in the down cycle companies cut costs and they consolidate and they deliver their balance sheets and in the up cycle when demand recovers and inflation is actually a very important tailwind corporate profitability is materially expand india is like that today corporate profitability is was as low as 1.5% of gdp the lowest we have ever seen in the last 30 years and we think valuations are misleading it looks expensive but it is on such a low base of earnings and i'll talk to you company wise also when we discuss this but the broader point is the this combined formula add operating uh, leverage out here earnings are coming off a low base in india the value in indians uh, india's uh, uh, equity picture is not in the valuation multiples the value is in the earnings multiples look high expensive but it's misleading which is the point i'm saying and when cons- when inflation goes up due to demand consolidation pricing power gets demonstrated and companies which have cut costs during the last few years i mean in, especially in the pandemic period we will now see recovery in earnings and you, i'm already seeing the first signs of it in the last 6 months where earnings are uh, especially in the second half of fiscal 21 india follows uh, april march uh, financial year when the first wave of pandemic uh, died down around july august of last year the second half recovery was very very sharp likewise the first the second wave ended around uh, late may the recovery we are seeing in june july and now in august is actually re- materially uh, uh, sharp recovery coming off and and that's where we our confidence basically comes from it's the not the pandemic led recovery but it's the com- entire picture which was in the lead up to pandemic continuing in the pandemic and now showing up as earnings but keep in mind this formula demand con- recovery industry consolidation inflation and operating uh, leverage and add de- uh, deleverage uh, to that which is which is actually the story which i wanted to highlight out here now in that context i'm going to talk to you about the capex cycle now co- indian co- government of india cut uh, tax rates about uh, two years back or shared less than two years back in September uh, 19. And as as, uh, Kenneth also highlighted, uh, deleveraging has been the mantra for corporates during this period. Corporate tax rate cut led to lower cash outflows and corporates have used it to uh, reduce the debt levels in their balance sheet. Now, that phase is maybe coming to a final phase of ending in that uh, steel sector will possibly be the final sector of deleveraging uh, or large extent deleveraging. Now, we think the way the picture has evolved, we think the likelihood of this benefit in the next two years getting diverted for CapEx looks very high to me. And I'll explain with some examples. Now, look at sectors like cement and steel. Now, the top 10 players are operating were operated in the second half when demand recovered as i told you they are operating at 87% capacity utilization whereas what appears is the industry capacity utilization for the full year was 67 very misleading because the top the industry is consolidated the top 10 players were 51% of market share now they are 67 their net debt to ebitda was 2.7 times now 0.3 times so they delivered their operating leverage has played out the cement inflation has started showing up government expenditure on infrastructure and real estate have started driving earnings growth uh, demand recovery for them so we think now they have no choice but to protect their market share they have to undertake capital expenditure the same story is in steel the top the industry is consolidated and they've gained market the top few players have gained disproportionate market share so now they are operating at close to about close to late 89 percent market share uh, uh, capacity utilization so they will need to now start planning capex so we actually think a capex cycle in india is on on or the first initial signs are on the anvil 
The same story is in oil and gas refining as well. India is undertaking a material ethanol blending program uh, by fiscal 25. 20% of uh, fuel sold in India needs ethanol to be blended. That needs a lot of capital expenditure. India is also doing a massive renewables push on their, on their power side. Thermal power unlikely to see capex, but renewables, a big thrust area for the government, and we will see massive investments out here. Now, to put it in conclusion, I'm saying cement, steel, uh, refineries, and renewables. This will drive capex. Another point to be kept in mind is the state-owned companies in India, in power sector, in oil and gas sector, and metal sector, they are going to drive capex. Their cash flows have started improving, and we see them uh, driving capex. I'm not sure you would have heard, you have been seeing this uh, abbreviation called PLI. It's called Production Linked Incentives. The whole China plus one uh, strategy, which the government of India has now started aggressively pursuing, as they have now announced incentives for multinational corporates to set up manufacturing facilities in India, and they are giving incentives. Now, if I look at the progress in the last 12 months, the committed capital investment in the next three years in these 14 sectors is to the tune of about 1.4 trillion rupees. And these are the companies who are 70% of them are multinational companies and global majors like a Samsung or a Foxconn. Uh, we are seeing it in across these segments, planned capital expenditure, which is to me an important driver. I'm also seeing real estate, household capital expenditure to be an important driver due to affordability. The difference between rental yield and home loan uh, the, the mortgage rate adjusted for tax ops, it's at a 10-year low. And affordability in the form of monthly mortgage as a percentage of income is at a 20-year low. And for non-resident Indians, and India has a teeming millions living in about 100 countries globally, the rupees depreciated 47 to the dollar about 10 years back to 74 now, whereas property prices have been flattish. So the same house is now 40% cheaper in dollar terms, making it more affordable. To me, that's a very important driver. Government of India has been prioritizing capital expenditure on infrastructure, on water, on roads and metro projects in multiple cities, um, on, on what is called a smart city programs. So we are looking at a 20% growth in government infrastructure expenditure, which is on a pretty large base. On In fiscal 21, the go total government uh, uh, infrastructure spend is in excess of 7 trillion rupees. That's a pretty large number, and we see it growing at about 20% even the next year. Another important driver for India is global CAPEX. S&P 500 companies have announced CAPEX. I read the transcripts of Cummins or ABB's parent. They're all guiding for 20% growth, which means exports. And India's overlap on exports with China is about 40% and increasing. India's, if you compare India, Vietnam, Thailand, which are the other two countries who can potentially take uh, some of the opportunities which will emerge from China. Now, I'm just comparing. They rank on quality of port infrastructure. India's ranked much better than Vietnam and Thailand. It's 51, 51 vis a vis Vietnam at 83 and Thailand at 73. India has 12 major ports. The container capacity is three times more. India has a, almost two and a half times bigger coastline. Availability of labor, much more. Labor cost, cheaper land acquisition cost much lesser than so india actually has a right to win in 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 some of these and i'm already noticing it in data vis-a-vis -vis the previous decade i'm noticing that the grow exports have picked up in india especially in the last nine to twelve months as as the pandemic uh, the the waves uh, whenever you're seeing the waves ebbing growth is picking up. And even in the April, May, June quarter, when India saw a surge in cases, the exports have actually continued uh, consistently. Uh, this leads me to 
my the next last comp, pop, portion of discussion, I'm going to explain to you why valuations are misleading in India. But before I do that, uh, maybe I should take a pause. If you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to take. We are 20 minutes into the conversation. So maybe it's time to take a pause. Uh, Ganesh, I think you can keep going with this okay. section. Um, Perfect. And then we'll do the questions at the end. Perfect. So why are valuations misleading? Okay. Now, now look at a, a company. Like, I'll explain with some maybe three examples. Let's take Maruti Suzuki, Indian subsidiary of Suzuki Motor Corporation, India's largest uh, passenger car manufacturer. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll explain to you why this is. Now, look at in the last five years, Maruti has invested about 350 billion Indian rupees, which is roughly like about a shade below the $7 billion on total investments. It's in the investments have come in the form of capital expenditure and operating costs in the form of employees or India's accounting needs research and development costs to be expensed out. So they've expensed it off. So we can't just look at uh, capital expenditure. We need to look at certain categories of operating costs. But what has come out of this? Their top line in the last five years has not moved and their earnings has actually declined in five years. So this investment is yet to pay off. So what you see here is EBITDA margins, which were 15% during fiscal 16, 17, 18, have now uh, in fiscal 21, they've dropped down to 7.5%. They have halved. They've put in the investments. The industry is the consolidated. The companies have, the company has done reasonably well on their product suite, on their market share, but margins have collapsed. And when I look at valuations, it's very misleading. Now, I'll tell you, I, I've just done a sensitivity out here. Now, as we all know, steel prices have gone up and metal, other commodity prices have gone up. Because the industry is consolidated, you can I'll give reel out a long list of companies who have gained market, uh, uh, lost market share. Just two companies have gained market share in India, Maruti and uh, Hyundai, the top two players. Eight companies, Honda, Toyota, uh, Nissan, Renault, uh, even even Ford, General Motors, they've all lost market share and and are are giving up their space to these two. So when when and now seeing I'm seeing demand recovery, consolidation, inflation, the first points, we think it lead to pricing power, and the sensitivity to earnings. I'm just explaining it here. If Maruti takes a three percent price hike, their earnings per share goes up twenty percent. Visavi, the base case. Now, how misleading consensus valuations are. On the face of it, it will appear 20 times EV EBITDA. But if there is a demonstrated minor price hike, it becomes 20% cheap, cheaper. So very misleading. And I've just taken 3%, which is actually in line with what they have done earlier years not exaggerated. So my point is valuations can be very misleading in India because we are coming off a phase where, as I told you, margins have halved and asset turns have come down. Companies have made investments on capital expenditure and operating expenditure, which are yet to convert into top line. Operating leverage will be very, very stark when demand recovers and pricing power gets demonstrated. This is a very important point in the whole discussion. I'll also explain it with another company's example. Shri Cement is India's best managed cement company. And we are very positive on government expenditure, on infrastructure, on real estate, on investment cycle, I told you. Cement is an ingredient needed in all of this. Now, this company has, is the extremely well-managed company. Uh, 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 you know, they have, they have, they have been right. gaining mark. Can I continue? Yeah. Okay. So they've, they've, look at their numbers. They've invested about $4 billion 
in both capex capital expenditure on incremental operating costs in the last 5 years but it's not got translated to any incremental top line or negligible bottom line it's it's hardly a, a, a return of of a 2% on the return on their invested capital whereas historically this companies operate post tax operating cash flows on invested capital is in excess of 30% so they are extremely capital efficient company but this investment is not yet percolated into top line and bottom line and as a result valuation multiples are misleading it again appears 20 times ev ebitda which you will say hey it's a cement company why is it 20 times you know but but it's misleading operating leverage is, is something that we think uh, uh, can be misleading uh, uh, i just wanted to drop a couple of such examples to you to explain why uh, uh, these are uh, misleading why valuations in india are 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 high appearing high optically high but that real picture is 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 in the details i'll maybe again i'll stop here we'll take some questions in the interest of time gundan you're on mute yeah so sorry uh, ganesh we probably uh, only have time for uh, one or two questions i would say um you know the key question that's on uh, most of the investors minds uh, in a region like australia is obviously india compares to other regions in emerging markets and uh, i suppose other destinations for growth capital and uh, most emerging market managers have generally said india looks expensive as you said uh, is it that they're looking at the wrong companies uh, which is you know as kenneth said those companies that have done well in the last cycle and perhaps valuations are full or is it that uh, it's expensive and we should accept that high earnings growth will neutralize that high valuation is it both yeah yeah it's it's a bit of both actually uh, the winners of the last uh, 10 years 15 years are 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 i have seen their margins especially in the consumption sector staples and and certain categories of consumption have reached uh, their 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 growth margins return on capital and valuations have reached a stage where there is very limited upside whereas the financials industrials the cyclicals like real estate or cement or or even automobiles there there is a lot more scope for earnings upside it might appear high on valuations but earnings are low balled so if the real story in india if i were investors looking at india global context i will look at indians the the india the company's earning statement and look at are the earnings low balled or are the earnings peaking out it's not the valuation multiples multiples will always be misleading in india so it's like a commodity company essentially you may buy the high pe stocks because uh, earnings are uh, at the bottom of the cycle exactly the cyclicals are actually where the biggest opportunities on returns or earnings growth in the next few years coming from i showed you the first chart on how corporate tax profitability to gdp can jump it will be led by cyclicals okay uh, thanks ganesh i really appreciate your time uh, and discussion um Uh, we're trying to keep it uh, fairly tight on the agenda so uh, we'll forward through any further questions we have uh, via gorum